Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Joanella Morales, and I'm a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And on behalf of the planning committee, I would like to extend a warm welcome to day two of our workshop on population descriptors for legacy genomic data, challenges, and future directions. And we are so pleased you have chosen to come back. For those of you joining us today for the first time, we had a great day yesterday. We first heard from NIH leadership about the purpose and goals of the workshop, followed by remarks from our co-chairs, Dr. Davis and Dr. Fullerton. They kindly set the stage for the discussions by providing key definitions so we can all be on the same page as we discuss. They also illustrated some of the challenges related to population descriptors and they also reminded us of the key guiding principles that were outlined in the NASM report, so we could keep those in mind as we continued our discussion. We then had some great talks focused on challenges related to the use of population descriptors and legacy genomic data, which set the stage nicely for the breakout groups. We considered 14 different challenges, and towards the end of our time together, we heard recommendations from each one of the groups. It was very nice to hear some common themes emerge. Um, and of course, you will hear more about this at the end of the day today So I, um, from our co-chair, so you'll have to wait until then. But in the meantime, we are very excited to have another day of discussion today. We will follow a similar structure as we did yesterday. We will start with a talk on population inferences and genetic similarity. Then we'll have a panel on addressing challenges related to harmonization and interoperability. We will then uh, break for a few minutes. Then we'll have a talk on adapting the NASM report framework to legacy data, which again will set the stage very nicely for the topic that is going to be focused as part of the breakout groups. Um, the breakout groups will be th thinking through how to adapt the framework, but through the lens of the distinct use cases that were described um, in the NASM report. Then we'll come back for a large group discussion then we'll have a break, and then we'll end with a summary of the workshop, the recommendations, and final discussion. And that will be led by the co-chairs, and by uh, and I will end at the end. So, of course, let's talk a little bit briefly about the logistics and best practices. We're so excited that you're all here. As always, make sure your Zoom profile shows your name and affiliation. Uh, your video and audio will be turned off by default to reduce noise and also because we are recording the workshop, but we do encourage your active participation. So turn your video on when you're discussing during the sessions and the breakout groups. If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A feature. You'll see it at the bottom in your controls. The moderator will collect and will read and we'll have um, a good time of discussion. And again, when you speak, please turn your audio and video on so that we all can see um, and recognize you. So again, today we will break out into groups and we're going, and I'm, so I'm gonna spend a little few minutes now just orienting us in terms of what will happen. Um, today we'll consider how best to adapt the NASM report, as I've mentioned already, and we have identified or highlighted here seven distinct use cases or study types here, um, the first one is on molecular and functional characterization, the second one on gene discovery, the third one on trait prediction, fourth one on health disparities, the fifth one on human evolution and population genetics, the sixth one on non-health outcomes, and the final one on clinical or diagnostic work. So we would ask you to please think ahead of time which one of these seven makes sense for you to join based on your line of work. And so when the time comes, um, a breakout icon, breakout room icon will appear over your controls. So go to the, you would go to the bottom where your controls are. You will see this icon pop up. When that happens, um, click join the breakout room. That will provide then the list of the seven groups that you can see here. Hover over the one you are interested in, click join. It will ask you to confirm your so choice, so say yes. And then please, we ask that you stay in your group and you participate. Um, and 
So we will go again through this again at the end of time. Uh, when the time comes, we'll go through the instructions again. But with that, I just want to let's get started and I will hand things over to the moderator for the next session, Dr. Um, Liz Gillanders, who from the National Cancer Institute, and she will lead us through the next session. The floor is yours, Liz. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, great. Thanks, Janella. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker this morning, Dr. Peter Kraft. Um, he is the director of the Trans Divisional Research Program in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, also at the National Cancer Institute. And he is an internationally recognized leader in both statistics and the genetic epidemiology of cancer. Uh, Dr. Kraft oversees the DCEG Bioinformatics Virtual Core and supports findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable principles for data management and sharing. So thank you, Peter, and look forward to your presentation. Okay, great. Um, thanks to the organizers uh, for the invitation, and I, I really enjoyed uh, yesterday's meeting. Um, uh, uh, there will be a lot of, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of the themes in my talk. I'll be recapping some of the points that were made yesterday, uh, trying to flesh them out a little bit and hopefully setting up the, setting the stage for the discussion to come. Uh, and I actually first wanted to lean into some of the ambiguities in uh, my title around population inferences. So is it a duck or a bunny or is it a dunny or a bucky? Um, maybe all of the above. Um, so, you know, I think there's really two ways you could read population inferences. In the one, you could be thinking about inferring some property about some population. So a mean, uh, incidence rates, prevalence uh, in a population as, as, as you define it. And the other way to read that is trying to infer population membership for samples um, from on the basis of some data that you've collected on those. Um, and to my mind, really, the first is is primary here. Um, uh, that uh, and and the thing that I want to underscore here is that populations that several people made yesterday, Malia led with the definite with some comments from the the NASM report that made this point, is that populations are constructed. Like we're the ones who define the populations. We're not discovering them. They're not sort of inherently there uh, out in the world. That we frame them um, uh, in our scientific. Uh, um, studies. Um, uh, so how we define them is going to be defined by the question at hand. So it's worth thinking that through carefully up front. Um, and in terms of population inference in the second sense, I think whether you do this and how you do this is really going to depend on, on, on your answer to number one, sort of what's, what's the scientific question at hand. Um, uh, so I think this is a, that's a secondary point. Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, explicitly call out something that that Jen mentioned yesterday, um, which is, you know, really um, uh, keeping in mind that these, you know, the how we define populations and even the questions that we're asking, the scientific questions that we're asking, asking are uh, historically contingent, and they're based on our positionality. So we should always uh, think hard about uh, why are we asking this question, about whom are we asking this question. Um, partly that's just good scientific practice, you know, okay, so I am stratifying my population into genetically homogeneous groups because I'm controlling for population stratification. Um, well, wait a minute, why am I doing that exactly? Is it really going to achieve that end? Um, so that's sort of just good scientific practice. Um, but also, again, sort of being being aware of like the things that we're asking and the scientific questions that we're asking may not be the most re relevant or appropriate for for the, the 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 folks we want to be studying and folks who should be benefiting from scientific research. Okay, so I want to talk about two kinds of population descriptors that come up in legacy data, uh, and uh, genetic and non-genetic. So as the NASA report pointed out, is that human populations can be described according to countless characteristics. Um, some of these we might look at and sort of classify intuitively as descent-associated. 
Um, so things like ancestry, geography, ethnicity, indigeneity, uh, racialized groupings. Um, uh, but there are also other important uh, characteristics that are, are going to be relevant for genetics and genomics research and epidemiology and population health research generally, um, such as urban versus rural, distance from a point source of pollution, smoking status, physical activity, and so on. So the challenge with legacy data is that we often haven't collected the relevant data. So a lot of things that we wish we would have now um, just aren't available because um, we didn't think, like folks didn't think of collecting them 30 years ago, right? Um, and it might be that conceptually, some of the concepts that we care about, they did collect data on those, but they collected them in uh, a way that isn't sort of how we would have wanted them to be collected now, uh, are not um, uh, easily harmonized with the, 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 the emerging data sets. Um, and certainly they weren't collected uh, similarly with each other. And I want to walk through a couple of examples of that and uh, highlight one approach of how we might handle it. So this is an example that came up in the context of the, the primed consortium. Um, so this is a consortium uh, uh, pulled together by the NHGRI and NCI to develop polygenic risk scores um, that are going to be perform well across multiple populations. Um, and honestly, uh, and, and, and on some level, just in terms of describing the diversity of the data sets that, that were contributing to Primed, we started to run into some challenges because people conceptualized and operationalized uh, uh, population structures differently. So for example, in the multi-ethnic cohort study, um, uh, folks were categorized into five ethnic groups um, these are coming off of uh, uh, questionnaire data, uh, and the, the language that was used in the, um, in the questionnaire and in the study is Caucasian, Japanese American, Native Hawaiian, African American, and Latinos. Another study that's in the, in the consortium is the Nurses' Health Study, uh, and there the questionnaire actually asked explicitly about ancestry, at least that's how the question was worded and asked. Whether that's how we would conceptualize ancestry now is a different way of, it's another question. Um, uh, and then the groupings are, you know, uh, you can see in there, the, the resolution is the greatest, but uh, so you, question, your major ancestry, pick one or more than one. Southern European, Mediterranean, Scandinavian, other Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, other. Um, and there's also a further question about um, re religious heritage. Um, then, you know, those are both U.S.-based studies, um, uh, but there were also studies in Prime that are that are not based in the U.S., either from Africa or the U.K. And there again, the the, the kinds of data that were collected are, are very different in the the uh, certainly the categories, um, and then the individual descriptors are going to be very different different and context specific. So, um, how to um, uh, handle this was was an open question um uh and uh so there's a there's a challenge of i think preserving the the detail that, as it was originally collected and then if you're going to put these data sets together and you want to um uh, have these different uh population descriptors talk to each other how do you go about doing that um so the the prime data model um uh is trying to um, sort of balance those two things. One is, um, you know, collecting the metadata needed to be able to describe um, uh, how these population descriptors were defined. Um, actually having a data file that would have the detailed study specific information. So not saying, not having a, a level of the a version of the data that's sort of as raw as possible, raw in quotes. Uh, and not automatically harmonizing to one standard uh, and losing some of the granularity and specificness of, of how different studies collected things, but then giving researchers the, the flexibility to do a mapping, a sort of label-to-label -label mapping for specific analyses. So if there's a reason to map everybody to Northern North, North, North America versus um, Northern Europe versus Africa, if there was a reason to do that scientifically, um, then you could using these labels uh, and you could describe exactly how you do it and justify it. Um, 
So, and, and actually one thing, so for if folks weren't here um, uh, yesterday, um, uh, Catherine Chow walked through an example of uh, a similar challenges that faced the, the Nomad team when they were trying to uh, harmonize um, uh, labels, um, uh, population descriptors from, from all the studies that contributed to Nomad. Uh, and if you go to the to the the her blog post describing how they did that, it, it goes into some of those nitty gritties. Um, and you know, I think this is just consistent again with one of one of the slides that Jen presented is that um, uh, we don't want to um, have people um, sort of map to a particular standard or advocate that this is the one the one way that descriptors should be described forever and and ever. Um, uh, that we should, uh, you know, retain some of the detailed information about how these data were collected, um, uh, and then give folks the flexibility of, um, you know, mapping those and harmonizing those for particular projects. And the key here is going to really going to be transparency. Okay, so for genetic data, um, so on some level, um, I think sequencing and genotyping data will be more standardized. At least the raw input data will be. Um, but of course, there's going to be many, many ways of operationalizing genetic similarity and genetic ancestry grouping. Um, uh, and whether or how you use similarity or some sort of researcher defined grouping will depend on the questions at hand. Um, and we're going to be talking about a lot of these use cases later in the day. So I'm just highlighting three here. Um, so if you're interested in gene discovery, say you're doing a genome wide association study, um, then your goal may be to control confounding. Um, in that setting, maybe genetic similarity is, is a good is is a, is a potentially good measure, and but genetic ancestry groups um, may be not fine enough to achieve the goal of, of controlling subtle um, uh, confounding. If your goal is trait prediction, um, then genetic similarity measures may give you some guide in terms of how well your um, your polygenic score, for example, will um, uh, generalize out to other populations. And again, just a sort of a, a gross ancestry uh, group label may not be fine enough to really sort of describe uh, how that works um, in, in a new sample, which may or may not uh, overlap well with, with the original training data. Um, and then again, Catherine gave an example from the NOMAD project of, of another um, uh, use case uh, which is very good classification. Um, so it may be relevant to know if a particular allele is common in any subgroup. So in the overall sample, for example, in the overall no-man sample, it may be very rare, but there may be a subset of folks um, where it's actually common, and that would have implications for um, uh, inferring pathogenicity. Um, so in that setting, ancestry groups may help describe some of that variability in allele frequencies. Um, uh, but there are different grouping methods. Um, so whether you're using uh, PCs, um, uh, as uh, Nomad has, or you're doing some sort of IBD modeling, as the folks at Biome have, um, they're going to have different strengths um, uh, depend and maybe better or, or less well suited for your particular application. Um, and I think there's uh, there's definitely an open area for for um, methods work on how to actually model the allele frequency distribution continuously across um, genetic similarity space. Um, so we may get into this more in, in more detail later in the day, but I just want to quickly introduce two ways, two general approaches to defining genetic similarity. Um, so on the left, I have a model-free genetic similarity. Um, principal components is a really good example of that. Um, uh, and on the right is a sort of more model-based uh, method of genetic similarity, so methods like structure or chromosome painting. Um, so the latter tries, usually ends up, you end up getting a, a set of coordinates which can be interpreted um, or can be, but maybe should not be, interpreted as sort of percent um, um, ancestry derived from a particular reference group. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges in that uh, that the uh, the NASA report uh, points out, and we'll probably get into later in the day, and we touched on yesterday. Um, but on some level, if you're just thinking of it as a measure of genetic similarity, um, it's I dump in a bunch of genotypes, and out comes some projection into genomic similarity space. So on the PCs, you, see, like, you can see that graphically on the left. Um, uh, and on the right, similarly, you end up with sort of 
several dimensions, um, depending on how many uh, quote unquote ancestral populations you've modeled. Um, I think the 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 challenge with the latter approach, um, you know, it may work perfectly well um, uh, operationally if you're trying if you just adjust for those continuous um, uh, um, measures. Um, uh, it may work perfectly well for con for control and confounding in a GWAS, for example. Um, but there's always going to be the the challenge of uh, not over interpreting those numbers. I think it's it's um, I think that that's the challenge. Whereas PCs, on some sense, um, uh, uh, are are because they're model free. There's less maybe less of a t in temptation. Um, all of these comes with with challenges, which I've tried to highlight on on the, on the slide here. Um, each is very sample specific, um, uh, and uh, when you're using reference data, it's also going to be uh, specific to the to the reference data. So again, uh, Catherine had an example of that where uh, when the reference data or your sample was missing a particular group, they're just not going to show up in your PCs. Uh, and there may be a potential uh, challenge there if we want to harmonize, quote unquote, um, uh, genetic similarity across various legacy data sets. Um, if we're projecting into, say, 1000 genome space, um, that may not be a very that may not capture some of the uh, idiosyncrasies, some of the subtle confounding that's happening in a particular data set. So there'll be a decision to make about whether you use in sample um, uh, genetic similarity uh, or you map into some common space. Uh, and again, that's going to depend on context to context. Um, this was a motivating example of when or why you might want to um, uh, adjust for genetic similarity in a in a genetic discovery sample, um, uh, we have run out of time. Um, so I'm just going to throw out there that, um, you know, uh, adjusting for genetic similarity in the forms of PCs, uh, at best, it's a proxy for the kinds of confounding that we want to we want to adjust for. Uh, and indeed, there are other things that we could adjust for if they're available that may actually be do a better job of adjusting for that confounding. Um, uh, so Quick take homes. Um, it's a re reminder that populations are illusions, and those can be useful illusions. But in some, in in many settings, they can also be harmful illusions. Um, uh, we should aim for transparency in the motivation and how we're uh, defining population descriptors, how we're implementing them. Um, uh, and finally, I think we'll talk about a lot today um, uh, is how do we make uh, the legacy data fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And I think that the, one of the key challenges there, as highlighted, I think, in the prime example, is, is really making it interoperable. Um, so thank you again. Um, and I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm happy to take some. Uh, thanks, Pete. So I think we have um, a couple minutes for questions. Um, there was one um, from a participant who asked um, if you could define a bit better what you mean by harmonize in in air quotes <laughs> yeah um so i guess when i conceptualize it um is uh you know the, to go back to the primed example where you had um uh you know the multi-ethnic cohort study which uh asked people about their um race and ethnicity using a particular set of labels, like you had to check those boxes and that's how the data is collected and stored. And then you had the nurses health study, which did it a, a different way. So if you wanted to combine those two studies and compare like pool, again, if, big if, you have to, like when, when, when would you do this? But if you wanted to, um, and you wanted to come up with a label that was say African-American, so how would you do that, given that they each study collected it a little differently? I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, one study used the label black, the other used African American. Do you do you call those the same thing in your merged data set? Um, uh, and uh, what does it mean if you're doing so? Um, uh, does that make scientific sense? And then just operationally, how do you do it? Um, Great, that thanks. Helps. Um, so there are a few more um, uh, questions. Maybe we'll take one more if that's okay. So could you elaborate on considerations for mapping into PC space using your study examples or mapping onto a space um, with external references? 
Right. Yeah. No. I, I mean, again, it's uh, it's going to be horses for courses whether whether you whether you want to do that. Um, so, I mean, like maybe in the in the PRS setting, if you want to know um, how similar is my sample to something that was used to train the the PRS, then you may want to map to a similar like into like a, a certain reference space. So you might use the thousand genomes to define that space. And then you could define a distance between the sample where you want to apply the PRS to the sample where it was trained. On the other hand, for confounding, um, like I alluded to, there could be all kinds of things that are driving that confounding in your data set, right? And your the, the genetic diversity in your data set could be very different than the genetic diversity that's captured in the first four principal components of the thousand genomes, right? So there, you might be better served by using the in-sample um, uh, um, uh, genetic similarity, um, as a you know, even if you do have multiple studies, if you stratify, um, so here's where maybe you would stratify by study, not necessarily by inferred population group, um, uh, because each study is going to have its own little nooks and crannies and potential confounding. So you stratify, you use um, uh, study specific PCs, study specific genetic similarity to control for confounding within each study. And then you do some sort of meta-analysis, doing that as opposed to mapping everybody to the same genetic space in thousand genomes, because that may not capture some of the data set specific um, confounding that you're worried about. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. So there are a couple more questions in the Q&A box, if you can maybe um, answer those as online, and um, I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, I would like to introduce um, the next session um, where we have, um, we're addressing challenges related to harmonization and interoperability of legacy genomic data. And we have two panelists. Um, we have Dr. John Witte from Stanford University. Uh, John serves as vice chair and professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health, and is a professor of biomedical data science at Stanford University. He's an internationally recognized expert in genetic epidemiology, and his scholarly, scholarly contributions, including deciphering the genetic and environmental basis of prostate cancer, and developing novel hierarchical and polygenic risk score modeling for undertaking genetic epidemiology studies. Um, we also have Dr. Karen Miga from the University of California, Santa Cruz, who will be giving um, a um, talk right after. And she is an assistant professor of biomolecular engineering at UC Santa Cruz and is associate director of human pangenomics at the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. Dr. Miga co-leads the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, which completed and released the first gapless sequence of the human genome in March, 2022. For this work, she was named as the one to watch in the 2020 Nature's 10 and one of Time's 100's most influential people of 2022. This should be an exciting panel um, on this topic. And as the um, panelists are speaking, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A and we'll address them as um, time permits. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first panelist. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak today. This is an incredibly important topic, and I really enjoyed the meeting yesterday, so I, I welcome any feedback today. Today, I'm going to talk about something that we touched on briefly at a breakout session yesterday, and that's how we can think about population labels or population descriptors in the context of a reference resource. And in this case, I'm focusing on a, a reference resource known as the human Pan genome reference resource. This is really building momentum um, with a lot of hope that we're going to modernize the human reference genome. I'm sure everyone on this call has utilized the human reference genome because it's been truly foundational for human genetic and genomic research over the past two decades. However, we all recognize that like all foundational technology over two decades, it's due for an, an upgrade. We know there are gaps. We know there are places that um, it's broken or perhaps doesn't properly represent any normal human haplotype. 
Also, the reference genome we know is linear, it represents um, a single, largely one individual. Therefore, it introduces things that we want to avoid in an era of precision medicine, like biases, um, and excludes important sequence variation that could help us understand disease. And as introduced, um, we're kind of in this wonderful era right now with long read data sets and assembly methods to where we can actually produce um, complete genomes at scale. Um, so this is a, a unique moment for us to try to modernize or replace this reference genome with a tool that actually works better. So this talk I'm giving is more of an introduction to this human pan genome reference consortium, which was a call to action from NHGRI um, to build a reference genome that better represents global genomic diversity. Here it's 1% of our, um, like CapMap or 1,000 genomes before us, we're trying to capture common variation. This would have a global allele frequency of at least 1%. To do this, we've organized a star-studded team of, of researchers who have, who've spent their career trying to build better reference genomes, crediting groups like the T2T, BGP, or even the HGSBC consortium. And in doing so, we've also organized a team of, of amazing scholars who have been working to build a whole repertoire of, of pan-genomic tools, workflows, and ways for us to build a new innovative ecosystem. Now, when we start thinking about uh, a reference genome, of course, we're not thinking about one linear reference genome anymore, but two. Every one of us, except for our gametes, of course, have this maternal and paternal haplotype that I'm trying to show as two lines. And a reference genome is just a collection of diploid genomes, as I'm showing you here um, with the multiple colors. And the way that we can organize this is into this unique data structure of where you can see the, the unique um, regions are the places where they diverge, illustrating variation versus the nodes where they have shared haplotypes or shared sequence similarity. And so essentially, we kind of think about pan genomes with three A's. This is, you know, we're, we're constructing assemblies from sequence data, we perform alignments, and then we enrich these genomes with annotation. To kind of bring us into the topic of today, what this is, it's a, it's a resource, right? It's open access. Um, the genomes that are being used are, are derived from pr participants who are broadly consented um, for this use of, of, a, of a resource like this falls within that jurisdiction of the consent. We're aiming for at least 500 uh, participants for about 1,000 diverse human haplotypes. And at the heart of this, to enable um, broad distribution of benefit of this resource, the same way we all benefited from the initial um, human genome project, it needs to be open access. It needs to be unrestricted use of the assemblies, sequence data, and technology protocols and standards. Another wrinkle into this is that we also are aiming to not only generate these reference genomes in the sense of their sequences, but also provide a whole um, biorepository, um, I guess, area or panel of cell lines. This would be LCLs or lymphoblastoid cell lines. And for a subset, we will also offer human iPSCs. And so here we have um, kind of a unique resource that we didn't have before, the initial human genome project, where we actually will allow researchers to push even further um, into utilizing these reference genomes in the context of cell lines and, and looking at, at many different models if you want to consider pushing on human iPSC research. And kind of tying into some of the breakout sessions that I know that are happening later, um, this really serves more as a coordinate-based system where we're hoping to shift all of that incredible knowledge that we've been building over the past two decades and even what we're generating now to start building base-by-base, -base, coordinate by coordinate information about functional and clinical annotation on top of it. So when we think about a reference genomic resource, what we're talking about really is a standard, well-characterized collection of genomic data that's used as a benchmark to compare and analyze genomics. Um, these resources include reference genomes. Um, they complete complete set, um, sets of DNA sequence within a species. And I really want to push on this. They provide a framework um, for identify variation and understanding gene function. So it's kind of like the foundation for a lot of the studies we're talking about today. Where legacy data comes into our study is that this is actually um, the main um, sequences that we're utilizing for the pan genome. In particular, we're utilizing cell lines that are available to us from the Thousand Genomes Project. This is important because these particular cell lines were consented for open science research resources like the one that we're developing. As mentioned before, the cell lines are available to our team so that we can begin to implement some of these long read and assembly strategies almost immediately when we started the consortium. 
And we already benefited from having a, a level of engagement at the community level around the descriptions or population descriptors that were used in the thousand genome studies. So we can inherit those population descriptors into our study. As I mentioned before, we're talking about 500 total genomes of which 350 involve cell lines that were established through the thousand genomes project before us. These are legacy lines. Um, they include population descriptors and they also benefited from community engagement. However, the reason that um, I'm positioning my talk here today is because we are acknowledging that the thousand genomes cannot fully represent what we understand will be global genetic diversity. And so now in the next phase of our project, we're starting to move into new perspective recruitment. This is both domestic and internationally. We need to have new opportunities to sit and think about how we're going to um, introduce new population descriptors. Are we going to introduce um, alongside new community engagement? How do we actually ensure that um, there'll be this type of interoperability between the past thousand genomes, legacy data sets, and any new data sets that we bring in to this study. When I said international, I wanted to also give credit that this is not um, an NIH funded initiative that's going to be leading the majority of the international partnerships. We are a driver project through the um, GA4GH. So therefore we're part of a federated alliance of many global genomic partners. Therefore we're working together to establish technical standards, ethical and policy standards, talking about metadata, the federated systems. And as mentioned in the prior talk, really focused on a lot of care and fair principles. So it's not just us defining the rules, but yet a global community coming together to establish how we'll build this um, you know, human pan genome project. This is really illustrated in this figure where there's a number of different um, work groups and work streams of which the US is just one that's sitting at the table um, trying to establish this foundational resource that will likely shape the way that we do genomics and genetics into the future. And all of the resources that we're building, the ways that we're building the pan genome, the way that we're building assemblies, also need to take into the context that we're not the only show in town. There's many other teams around the world who are building pan genomes now and how we intersect, interact, share tools and benefit from these emerging pan genome projects around the world is something that um, is something our team thinks very deeply about. So when thinking about a global human pan genome, I think that there are some questions that naturally arise. We're thinking about reference genomes that are generated around the world, not by our team. Um, do they have population descriptors, yes or no? Did they generate those with or without community support and community engagement? Um, it's very likely that there will be reference genomes that don't have matched cell lines or matched iPSCs. How does that dictate the way we think about individual population descriptors? And then new population descriptors um, perhaps will be issued through these other initiatives, through their own study protocols. How do we think about that in the context of this new reference genome? And I, I think it's important for us to even have this big topic question in front of mind. The pan genome is a reference resource. It's a tool, much like the current reference genome is, to enable our best science. Perhaps understanding the population descriptor for HG. 38 or HG19 isn't necessarily dictating your best science right now. Um, are population descriptors, for example, at the level of the individual useful or necessary for a reference genome or a pan reference genome, like the one that we're describing now is something that we're um, talking about and would love to have feedback. What are meaningful um, annotations perhaps that we can consider that would perhaps happen at the level of a haplotype giving genetic similarity measurements as, as presented in the last talk, that maybe that would provide more context to imputation or annotation of, of variants for um, further study. One idea perhaps would be to look at meaningful annotation at the level of haplotypes. Um, one could imagine doing this, looking at kind of a continuous genomic segments, utilizing reference panels or reference databases. The nice thing here is that this can evolve and change over time. It can grow as we start to learn more and more. We can have labels or descriptors, for example, that could take word clouds um, that could provide more context um, over segments of our assemblies rather than having to have one label per individual genome describing two separate haplotypes. So in summary, uh, the human pangenome reference will be a foundational resource 
for genetics and genomics research in the future. It will be comprised of at least 500 assemblies representing legacy data of a thousand genomes and a subset of new prospective recruitment, which may or may not contain cell lines and may or may not have population descriptors. We need to question, is it necessary, useful, or is it harmful to include population descriptors and ancestry information in this type of reference resource? And if so, should we start to work together with our global community to establish new standards and expectation for the community around descriptors, really um, providing some effort to provide new guidelines and, and perhaps agreement on how we're going to work on an international stage? Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. This was a great talk. And we do have a question um, in the, in the Q&A um, that says, an issue is that the current statistical methods do not allow for using non-linear references. Is there any progress on this? So I think that a lot of the non-linear references that we're hoping to release, we're hoping to actually onboard a lot of new tools and new methods. And so although I, I hear that there may be limitations now, I think that that's the charge of our whole consortium is to try to work with the community to try to advance tools to work with this new data structure over the next coming years. And I should also note, I think that's always important um, for teams to hear this is that prior reference, um, linear references like HG38 and 19 are part of the path. So some of the coordinate based systems that folks are used to using will still be there if they need to have that type of information for their, their study. But I don't think that necessarily addresses the question of the tooling that I want to say, once again, um, needs attention over the next coming years. Yeah, thank you. And we have another question. Um, how good are the pan genome references for African populations? And do we need a reference population for um, African populations? I want to really celebrate the idea that we are becoming this international pan genome project, of which there is a, an African pan genome project that's being led in Africa that's part of um, our, our group, our international cohorts. So in that case, the hope would be that we would be able to see um, that kind of enshrinement of sharing of genomes around the world, that it would not need to be necessarily led by the United States. Of course, we do have access to genomes that have population descriptors as being from Africa in thousand genomes. Additionally, we have opportunities for prospective recruitment for the next 200 genomes over the next phase to recruit individuals once again who represent um, haplotypes that would come from a country within Africa. Um, but this is something that we're still um, considering. We haven't been in the past selecting genomes using population labels or population descriptors. Rather, we've been doing um, a sequence or a, a label-free approach where we look for common variation or very old variation. And we've been working through tooling and, and um, sample selection using variants alone and not um, selecting based on, on population labels. Great. Thank you so much. Um, due to time, we'll have to move on to our next panelists, but um, um, Dr. Miga, there is a question that just came um, in the Q&A, if you don't mind answering that. Um, and next, we have Dr. John Woody. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak here and for um, organizing this uh, conference. It's been really great. I've, I've learned a lot, and um, I'm really looking forward to continuing discussing um, the issues that we're dealing with here. So we've talked a lot about the challenges that we face, um, and in, in particular with regard to harmonization and interoperability. Um, a lot of time was spent in the breakout sessions yesterday talking about how to address some of the challenges. Um, so I've actually just put a little list of different um, challenges that we're facing, uh, data access and sharing, annotation and curation of data, um, metadata, having that be comprehensive and informative, uh, data formatting and quality control, privacy and consent. And actually this list could get quite long, the different challenges we're facing. And um, I realized that the, the title of this session is how do we address these challenges? And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, when I work through this, these are really hard 
questions, um, some harder than others, but it's um, quite a bit of work to address all of these challenges. Now, what I'd like to touch on briefly right now is how we harmonize data for pooled meta or test um, testing prediction models and analyses. And um, this is actually coming from, from motivated by my own work and I think is uh, relevant to a lot of people's research here on the in this session. So um, studies often combine data from multiple different sources. And these include uh, often include what I call quote unquote legacy data. And um, these data are generated often with different ancestry approaches. So I want to motivate a little bit from a project that I've been working on, um, which is a precision prostate specific antigen consortium. Um, and in this consortium, we've been combining data from numerous different studies. Some of the studies only share summary statistics, for example, the Million Veteran Program, and um, that may be generated with analyses that control for a certain number of principal components. Others provide individual level data to, to the consortium, um, and those data are often provided with a range of different genetic ancestry approaches. So let me give you a specific example. Um, this is from what's called the SELECT trial, which um, was looking at whether or not um, it was a randomized control trial, seeing whether selenium and vitamin E could prevent cancer. And this trial found actually not only did it not work, but that vitamin E increased the risk of prostate cancer. Um, this was a large scale study, NCI funded, and a, a really valuable resource. I mean, even though the, the trial was stopped and, and it didn't show the hypothesized association uh, being protective, uh, there's actually extensive data and relevant specifically to our PSA consortium. So um, we were able to uh, obtain these data from SELECT um, and in their um, information, they provided these this information about race and ethnicity. Um, and uh, so you can see that they use kind of commonly uh, group, commonly used population descriptors and groupings, um, Black, multi-ancestry, multi Native, um, ancestry, Pacific, Asian, unknown, and white. So they also did genotyping with the Illumina uh, Infinium Global Screening Array, and ancestry was estimated using LD prune markers and running SNP weights using HapMap reference panel with just three populations, European, West African, and East Asian. So um, they did this and they, uh, they provided us with two global PCs from these populations. And um, then what was interesting, um, I thought, was that they actually um, grouped ancestries based on their individuals into ancestry groupings based on their ancestry score. So if you had a score of greater than 0.8 for one group, you would go into a single ancestry group. Then you would go into what they called an admix cluster, depending if, if your ancestry score was above 0.2 and less than 0.8 for only one group. And here's a specific example. If AFR was 0.75, EUR was 0.17, EAS was 0.08, then that would go into an admixed AFR group. And then they had another group um, of intermediate ancestry clusters. So this may look similar to the previous group, but it's slightly different. In this group, you've got at least one score with above 0.2 in addition to the, the majority group. And then PCs were calculated within each cluster. So here's the results from this grouping. So again, this was the data that was provided to us from SELECT. Um, and you can see that uh, this admixed AFR and, and um, AFR EUR that I just described, these are the number of individuals from those two populations. And then we have some very small groupings, AFR, ASN was only three individuals, um, and et cetera, down through different possible admixture groupings. So we're wrestling with, you know, what, what do we do with these data? Do we collapse some of these groups together? Do we actually, um, should we redo the ancestry relatedness ourselves using a newer reference panel? Should we recalculate more global PCs for everyone? Um, should we be defining clusters based on 
greatest genetic similarity and then recalculating PCs just for those groups. And then even um, depending on, on what decision points, it, the decisions we made, how do we actually return the information we've generated to select, for example, the full principal components so others can actually access these um, data for future analyses? We've talked a lot about legacy data and um, I, I think there's kind of an in-between data that I'm going to call legacy-like, and I think select may be somewhat in this realm. So they're, I, you know, they're continuing. They've been continuing to get more, more information on these individuals, but so direct contact is feasible, but not for us, right? So, so it's not as though we have the ability to have direct contact with participants. And I think this is the case with a lot of data that we wouldn't consider legacy data, but um, are kind of legacy-like in a practical sense. Um, now, something that was mentioned yesterday in, in a um, discussion I was part of was that we need ancestry groups to assess polygenic risk score performance and uncertainty. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Um, and that's because we can use continuous measures to assess accuracy and uncertainty. For example, distance-based or neighborhood-based. And um, many of you are undoubtedly familiar with this figure from Yi Ding's paper um, last year in Nature, which shows that polygenic risk score accuracy decreases with increasing distance to the center of the training set in principal component space. And um, so what this means is that you can actually um, assess individual level polygenic score accuracy um, and, and you don't necessarily, you can use distance information. You don't necessarily have to group people into ancestral populations. Um, and then some work that's being done by a, a PhD student um, at Stanford, working with myself and Linda Kachuri, is actually to look at polygenic risk or uncertainty with genetic neighbors. And the idea here is, is to visualize principal component space as kind of an accuracy landscape. And in this case, um, we don't have a single um, set of circles. So if we're look, talking about the distance from the center of a um, model, like we were with, with the work from um, that I mentioned previously from Yi Ding, in this case, there's a really, we're not going to have a single centroid that we can look at with respect to distance. And so in this case, what we could do um, and what, what Karen has proposed to do is to use a genetic neighbors approach. So in this case, K-nearest neighbors. And so you don't use any information about self-identified or genetically inferred ancestral groupings. Instead, you, you, you kind of use principal components as a continuous ancestry measure. And um, one nice thing about this approach is you don't necessarily need individual level training data um, for this. So, for example, with our PSA consortium, we received summary statistics from the Million Veteran Program, and we can use those for our training set. Um, and how this works is that the genetic neighbors actually reflect model accuracy and allow for um, getting prediction intervals for uncertainty for a given individual. Okay. So, how are we going to implement um, and the the things that we've been talking about here? Well, I think the first place to start is education and training. Um, if we want to make change, that's really obviously important. Report that comes out from this meeting, um, editors and journal requirements, for example, the JAMA piece recently coming out, um, NIH um, and funding agencies and reviewers and grants. And I think we need to be certain to to kind of provide concrete recommendations while allowing for situational flexibility. Um, in other words, it kind of depends on what you're you're doing. And this, I think it may be difficult to specify some of the aspects that we're talking about here. For example, Jen mentioned um, yesterday um, that we shouldn't do something if we don't know that the results are gonna be trustworthy. And that's a hard thing to quantify. Like, what does it mean to be to be trustworthy? Um, and with that, I'll stop and open it up for, for panel discussion and um, questions.
a great discussion. This really gets at the heart of uh, what um, this um, whole um, webinar series has been about. And um, we have, you have a question um, in, uh, as our training sets become multi-ancestry, how will distance-based measures work? And would you be able to set multiple centroids in the neighbor-based approach? And how do you then adjust for density of those centroids in terms of representation in the training set? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, the, the idea with the um, neighbor-based approach is to have multiple centroids. And um, the density, so the, uh, the density can be defined by distance or what we've been doing is more of numbered neighbors. So, you know, maybe a thousand neighbors. So in that way, you're kind of adjusting for the density of, um, of the, the number of neighbors around a given individual. Um, and that will be reflective of the, the kind of density of, of the whole of the centroids and the whole um, accuracy landscape. All right, great. Um, and we did have um, a, a question, but I think it's been answered. But I'll, I'll restate it. I think it's good. Um, I think it replies, applies to both talks. Like, what what's the consequences of not using population descriptors? Um, and then, um, you know, when when is it appropriate? I'm thinking about especially in epidemiology, you know, health disparities research. Um, it's important to know. Um, you know, the population of people because there's certain behaviors that also co-migrate with that. So um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. So the so the, the, the question is, are we, can we really walk, walk away entirely from this? From yeah. Descriptors? Um, it depends. <laughs> I mean, I think that if, if you're, um, we've talked a lot about, uh, from an epidemiologic perspective or social determinants of health that that many of these things may be more accurately assessed using population descriptors. There's no reason why we can't simultaneously be modeling both. Um, there, there are questions about kind of core collinearity between them, um, but you could imagine having in a model both um, kind of individual distance or neighbor-based factors, but also um, population grouping factors that would maybe get at different aspects. I don't know if Karen has anything to add or, or anyone else. Yeah, it's definitely... Not a straightforward answer, but I, I, I do appreciate that, you know, considering your model and what question that you're asking um, to have um, to to uh, compensate for, for different um, um, aspects. Um, we have a question is, how do you use samples with unknown or multiracial self-reported um, samples in genetic studies? Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if that's just a general question. Um, and I think it, it um, one question is, you know, is, as Pete laid out the three different aspects of what you might be interested in doing, are you in the discovery set situation for finding new variants associated, or are you in the prediction um, or assessing differences um, in variants? And I think that those would, um, maybe different answers for the different questions. But again, I think it feels like there's a lot of movement toward PC space. Um, so with that, we have a question about why use PCs? Um, they say PCs are a projection of genetic similarity space, left in certain directions, but not others. Why not just take pairwise genetic distance between the individuals for K and N? Similarly, for GWAS, can correct with linear mixed models, which use full information rather than PCs. 
Yeah, so this is a great point, and it's something that that um, that we will be considering. Um, so just to actually look at um, at, at you know sharing among instead of yeah, that's a that's a good point, Richard. So definitely something to consider again. With this, it comes with um, I think you know additional exploration in the field and publications and and discussions such as these so um um we have time for one more question because we're a little over but we'll take it um the comment says i favor labelless approach for many scenarios that though leaves implementation of clinically significant genetic findings perhaps more difficult if you would go the labelless approach that so the labelless approach is actually what in a clinical setting is what inspired Karen's work, and that is if someone walks into a clinic and there's a genetic test, say for a polygenic risk score, um, how do you actually use the results? How do you actually classify their risk and um, their un the uncertainty in that estimate? And so um, that idea, the the neighbor approach is really to be able to take someone who has, you know, without any label on them in a, and in, in make a kind of clinically relevant prediction for them using just the neighbors that they have without actually classifying them. So I think that there is potential, basically everything we're talking about, about incorporating genetic information um, instead of groupings, um, is relevant not only for discovery and prediction, but but for implementation and clinical application. Great. Well, this has been a very engaging and, and thoughtful um, session. Thank you both to Karen and John. Really appreciate your time today. And with that, we'll break for lunch. Thanks, everyone.